in 94 when the Republicans had another wave of, you know, and they came in and they, you know, kind of took the House in, in Congress over, um, I, I think the American people felt that a lot of the promises they made at that time weren't kept. Uh, are you guys going to keep your promises this time around? Well, I think what you saw, unfortunately, was uh, a degradation over that time period, over that 14 years, from the initial uh, uh, charge, if you will, by then Speaker Newt Gingrich and the the contract with America crowd that came in, and then the change in leadership within the Republican Party, and really the changing of principles. And that was that they went from being very fiscally conservative, people who fought uh, tooth and nail with then President uh, Clinton, even went so far as to shut down the federal government over federal spending, to a party who thought we could spend our way into keeping the majority. In other words, mm -hmm. we're going to pork up bills, we're going to spend more money, uh, and justified it by saying, well, this is preventing them from having the gavel. Um, I would say that those who were there, I wasn't there, but those who were there that are there today have learned their lesson. I would say that guys like uh, Paul Gosar, who are running here, are representative of members that are running all over the country, who have said, if we get elected, we're going to stay true to our fiscally conservative principles of living within our means, of limited government. And Paul, with myself and other new members, can go to Washington, D.C. and hold our, our leadership accountable. At the end of the day, the reason that Nancy Pelosi is getting away with what she's getting away with is because her Democratic members are supporting her doing it. Rest assured, regardless of who the Republican Speaker is, regardless of who the Republican Majority Leader is, uh, they're going to be held to account by us rank and file members, Paul included as a new member, uh, to live within our means and, and stay true to those fiscally conservative principles that we all ran on. Dr. Go, sorry, you've mm -hmm. made a lot of sacrifices for this campaign. You've given up your business, you've um, gone into this full time, and um, why don't you explain why this is so important to you? Well, I feel this is our last free election. Um, and I don't think if we, if we don't get it right, um, then we're forever bound into a, a, a type of America I never dreamed about. And I think we're all in this together. Um, so if you're, you can't be part in, you have to be all in. There's no, there's no part way. What, what will be your first area of focus if you get elected? District 1. District 1. District 1. All solutions that we need start here. When we understand our problems, then we can start taking care of other problems for other folks. And we can advocate on behalf of our problems. And I think what's happening in Main Street America, which is District 1, we're a rural district, we're, some, we're small business, that's what gets it. And if we can come up with our solutions, then I can get back in Congress with Aaron and all those other folks that we can make a big difference for small business and the, the free market enterprise. That helps all of us. You seem, and throughout your campaign, to um, feel that we've also lost track of the Constitution in a lot of what's happening in Washington right now. And um, I, I understand you feel that we should be looking at programs and entitlements and everything in light of the Constitution. Um, what, what's that, what does that mean and what is that going to look like? Well, I think you know, our forefathers had a template that, that brought this country to be, being the greatest. Um, they sacrificed everything in which to found this, this nation. And it's those same principles that we have to re-energize, we have to get back to. Um, we can't be takers. We all have to be givers in some aspects. And that's what we've lost. We've lost the character of this country. And we have to reinstill that. Not only as us, as those being elected or trying to be elected, but those that, that stood throughout these um, uh, generations, that stood for something, for the lives that they gave on battlefields, to those that were policymakers, to those that are the newest members of our, of our uh, culture that don't see the light at the, end of the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel and don't understand what made this country great. Congressman Schock, have you, been have you noticed or been frustrated that the Constitution is kind of a, a left-behind document at times in, in Washington as, as you're considering bills and that sort of thing to, to vote on? You know, uh, sometimes we make this job more complicated than it is. You don't have to be a constitutional scholar to serve in Congress. You need to be a good listener. And the reason why Washington, D.C. Is, is gone so far amok is simply because they've stopped listening to their constituents. Uh, if Ann Kirkpatrick uh, and Speaker Pelosi 
uh, and all the other members of Congress would go back to their districts and actually listen to their represent listen to their constituents about what they want done on health care, about what they want to do on job growth, about what they want to do on new energy growth. Uh, we wouldn't have the kind of ruinous legislation that's been passing in Congress. We wouldn't have the infringement on our constitutional rights uh, that our founding fathers had envisioned. That's why you're seeing this uprising. That's why you're seeing the Tea Party movement of people who have never been involved in politics before saying, you know what, enough is enough. I, I can't continue to shoot emails off. I can't continue to lick the stamps and send in letters to my, my, my representative. Because guess what? They're not listening. They're not listening in this district. They're not listening all around the country. And so on Election Day, I think you're going to see a revival, uh, not just in the 1st District of Arizona, but all over the country, because the representatives haven't represented their districts because they haven't listened to their constituents. So, you know, I, I take a pretty simple approach to this job, and that is if I go home every weekend, as I do, since I've been in Congress for two years, I've gone back to my district, I've traveled my 20-county district, and I know exactly where my constituents are on these bills. So when I go back to Washington, D.C. during the week, it's very clear where I stand. It's very clear where my constituents want me to be. And I can tell my colleagues who I serve with in very plain English, understandable terms, why the bill does not make sense for my constituents, why the health care bill is going to raise costs, why the health care bill is going to make it more uh, difficult to provide health insurance. And the same thing with cap and trade, the same thing with the stimulus bill, why that bill was bad. In fact, the President of the United States, ironically, came to my hometown of Peoria, Illinois, the day before the stimulus vote, and he visited Caterpillar Tractor Company. And among all his speech and glory, he said, Please contact your congressman, Aaron Schock, and tell him to vote for this bill. And of, a, of, of hundreds of people that were in that factory floor, not a one of them, after finding out what was in that bill, contacted me and asked me to vote for that stimulus bill. In fact, I had 1,400 Caterpillar employees alone contact me and tell me to vote against the bill. What does it tell you? It tells you the American people are smart. It tells you that if you're a representative and you listen to your American people and you listen to your constituents, uh, you're not going to get far away from where, where our founding fathers wanted us, uh, and you're going to do the right thing. And that's exactly the kind of representative Paul is going to be. He's been working his tail off traveling this district, showing up to places that uh, the congresswoman has not been to in two years. And you know if he's working this hard as a, as a candidate for Congress, that he's going to work even harder uh, when he's got the, the full infrastructure of the office of congressman for Arizona's first district. Are you going to be able to undo some of the damage done by, say, Obamacare and, and some of the other legislation that they've passed? You know, Lynn, I get frustrated sometimes over what's happened, but the beauty of our country is that we can actually do something about it. We can do something about it at the election polls and, and who we elect, and we can then do something about it with the people who, who go to Washington, D.C. and have that power. Um, I'm not a defeatist mentality. I don't, I don't think all hope is lost. Uh, have some pretty damaging things been passed? Yeah. But at the end of the day, this is still the great pl best place on earth to live. And uh, as messy as our politics can be, I joke with my constituents that, you know, our Congress is our government's alternative to violence. So at the end of the day, uh, when you elect new people to Congress, they can go and change things that prior Congresses did that weren't correct. And that's exactly what Paul can do uh, work, working with, with folks like myself and others to right the wrongs, and then more importantly to do things positively that we need to do to get our country back on track. Dr. Gosar, on your, um, you said one of the things you want to do is you want to listen mm -hmm. to your constituents. Are, are you willing to, to commit right now that if, if you go to Washington and you end up not listening and you end up not being responsive to your district, that they can just vote you out the next time around? Founding Fathers put that checks and balances in, and I would expect nothing less.